Ladies and gentlemen, if we could have your attention, we want you to please welcome the governor of the great state of West Virginia, Governor Jim Justice. scheduled to be with us this morning. James C. Justice II was born April 27, 1951 to James Conley Justice and then the Ruth Justice. He attended Raleigh County Public Schools right here, graduated from Woodrow Wilson High School, attended Greenbrier Military Academy. He also went to Marshall University in Huntington, was captain of the golf team before earning his undergraduate degree and a master's in business administration. Justice has spent his career creating thousands of jobs. He joined his family's business in 1974. Because of his strong interest in nature and the outdoors, he started the Justice Family Farms in 1977. He now has the largest farm east of the Mississippi River. Upon his father's death in 1993, Jim became the president and CEO of Bluestone Industries, Bluestone Coal. Over the next 15 years, he launched a massive expansion of multiple businesses. In 2009, he rescued the Greenbrier Resort in White Sulphur Springs from bankruptcy. Since then, he's brought major events like the PGA Tour, training camps for the NFL, the NBA, and countless high-profile acts and conferences to the beautiful Greenbrier. Continuing the family's tradition of being major supporters of youth programs, he's been president of Beckley Little League since 1992. He's coached basketball teams of all ages for 37 years and is currently the head girls basketball coach at Greenbrier East High School. He's a very busy man. The governor and first lady Kathy have two children, James J. C. Justice III, who runs the family's coal and agricultural operations, and Dr. Jill Justice, president of the Greenbrier Hotel Corporation and a physician at the Greenbrier Clinic. The Justice family also includes Jay's wife, Catherine Granger Justice, and Jill's husband, Adam Long, and their son, Justice Charles Long, the first grandchild for the governor and the first lady. Jim and Kathy live in Lewisburg with Lucy and Ellie, their two Boston Terriers. Once again, let's please give the governor of the great state of West Virginia a warm, warm welcome. Thank you so much for waiting around on me. I'm glad you held up breakfast waiting on me. <laughs> no, you did the right thing. I'm going to go right here where everybody can see and hear or whatever and, and uh, for good or for bad. But uh, again, I appreciate you having me. And we've got an incredible crowd, and that's really neat stuff. And you're here in many different capacities, I'm sure. But one of the main reasons you're here is the very, very reason that we're all here, and that is the blessings of our dear Lord and God above. Amen. Now, let me just tell you this. Being the governor is uh, a pretty bizarre thing at times. It uh, is probably one of the more thankless jobs that a person can do because it seems like a lot of times no matter what you do, you know, there's someone out there somewhere that's taking some pot shot at you and, uh, and whether it be even remotely fair or not, it doesn't really seem to matter. And so there's days that it becomes really lonely. Now, and I can tell you that if you're, if you're Jim Justice, or all the great successes that you are, there's times in your lives you feel the same way. You feel like you may, you may very well be doing everything you could possibly do 
And you could very well be delivering in every way that you feel like you should be delivering. And yet, there's somebody somewhere throwing a rock. Now, you know, that's where the loneliness comes into being. And then you feel like, in many ways, that there ought to be somebody that just could hold my arms up or help me hold my arms up as those that were helping Moses hold his arms up. And lots of times they're not there. And yesterday was surely one of those days with me. You know, we had these incredible, incredible floods. And when they happened, the worst events of my life, other than me losing my mom or my dad or very, very close family members, and I'm very thankful that we didn't lose one of those in the flood, but I was there. I was in the mud, and I was in the houses, and I saw all the despair, and I helped every way that I knew that I could possibly help. We took people in at the Greenbrier. We hunted bodies. We hunted poor Michaela Phillips every single day for six weeks. A 14-year-old beautiful girl, and I can't tell you the number of times that I prayed on the way to the Greenbrier that just some way, somehow I could see her and just go over and maybe put my coat over her because I knew that she was gone. But the family really needed closure of some way. And in all that, some way, somehow, no matter how hard I tried, no matter how much I delivered, then all of a sudden came the stones. And so as I was driving yesterday on my way home, this came across my little flip phone. And my flip phone's ringing. <laughs> now, I don't have any fancy iPhones or whatever. I've still got my little flip phone. <laughs> and it's 15 years old. <laughs> but I just think, and I think back oftentimes about, you know, a man that Gosh, I'll, I'll never be a grain of sand compared to how great Moses was. Never. And, and yet, I think about him trying to take care of all the people. And there was times when they complained and they threw rocks. Now... And so while I was basically feeling sorry for myself yesterday, and I was driving along, from time to time over the last, in fact, every year over the last several years, at one of our farms, through the Make-A-Wish people and through the, the people that, you know, are our game wards and our DNR and the Bear Hunters Associations and all that kind of stuff. Believe it or not, there's kids that request as one of their wishes that they'd like to go on a bear hunt of all things. <laughs> now, and so every year, true as it can be, for up to up to up to years, we take a couple of those kids on a bear hunt. And every year they get their bears. Now, and there's probably 15 people from the DNR and the game wardens and everything that take them. And I think year before last, one of those kids killed a bear that was way bigger than me. <laughs> it was the biggest black bear probably ever, ever taken in the state of West Virginia. It weighed 680 pounds. Now, we weighed it on our scales, and there's all kinds of verifications of that. 
A typical black bear in West Virginia weighs about 140 to 160 pounds. This thing was seven foot five inches tall. A black bear in West Virginia. And who got it? One of the little Make-A-Wish kids. It couldn't have possibly been any better. But yesterday, as I'm going down the road, halfway feeling sorry for myself, and wondering, you know, really and truly, what's wrong with people? This comes across my phone. And it comes from Tennis Cook, who is a, is a former game warden. He says, Sean O'Brien from Iowa, who got a bear on the hunt in In December of 2017, this past December, lost his fight with cancer. June 3rd, and Sean's picture in the hospital bed came across my phone. Now listen. There was no time for me to be, be feeling sorry for myself, for mm -hmm. people throwing stones at me. You know, I really think that we as a state are on our way to doing all kinds of greatness. And within all that, there's going to be stones, and there's going to be stones in your lives, and there's going to be blessings. And all we can do is trust in the good Lord in every way to take care of us and give us strength to keep going and keep doing the right things. And so for my, for my life, here's how I feel. And I feel this way with all my body. And I feel blessed in every way to know the good Lord. I feel blessed in every way to have great friends that are right here that know him as well. And I feel really, really blessed to know that I trust, I really believe that the good Lord made me Jim Justice for a reason. And he made you who you are for a reason. Now, a lot of people would say to me, they would say, Jim, why in the world, for crying out loud, you're fat and you're and y'all can laugh at that <laughs> and you're older and your hair's white and you've done a lot of stuff you know why don't you just kick back why do all these things and my answer is just as simple as this and I mean it as long as he gives me breath he made me Jim Justice for a reason and I'm going to keep on doing everything I possibly can to make things better, no matter about the stones. And I'm going to do it in lots and lots of ways. Now, you were kind enough to wait on me to eat. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, and you were kind enough, and I, and, and, and you see, I don't, I don't have any presidential or gubernatorial notes, I just come and speak to you from the bottom of my heart. And, and I can tell you that I appreciate you. You're the leaders in our communities in every single way. Now, I would ask you just this. Because I don't have those notes and now you've heard my message, I would like you to do this. I would love for you to ask me something that's on your mind. Ask me something that you're concerned with. I could, I could have come in here and said and told you, said, West Virginia is on a move beyond belief, and it is. It truly is. I could have told you that the day I walked into office, you have never in your life. I mean, I'm a business guy. You have never in your life 
seen a company in the world that was more bankrupt than we were as a state. No way. No way could we function. Nowhere to turn. Nowhere to turn. Couldn't take any more money out of rainy day fund. The reason you couldn't do that is because our bonds were already being derated. There was no jobs. Drugs were running rampant. What are you going to do? And really, truly, what I did a lot was pray. And really, I trusted. I felt like, you know, and, and, and where could I? Where could Jim Justice, the little guy that grew up, started on Ford Street in Beckley, West Virginia, in a little rented house, where could Jim Justice, with grandparents that didn't have indoor plumbing, where could Jim Justice come up with an idea like our roads or whatever, when all the people prior to me had never thought of that? Where could Jim Justice have come up with the coal idea and took it to the President of the United States of America, honestly, and sit right across from his desk. Now, can you imagine this? Little Jimmy Justice, and I was skinny at one time. <laughs> <laughs> Little Jimmy Justice sat in the Oval Office. This is absolutely the gospel fact. Right across, and I don't know the name of that desk. What is the name of the desk in the, in the Oval Office? No, it's not an Oval Office, but the desk. Resolute. The Resolute desk. Right. Okay. And it's not that big. It's about as big as this table, to tell you the truth. And I'm sitting there, and the President's on the other side, and I'm on the other side, and I'm fiddling like I do with my hands all the time. And I kid you not, all of a sudden, one of those drawers from the desk goes, and just opens on my side. <laughs> And I closed it back real quick because I thought, what in the world's going on here? <laughs> but in all of that, I was telling the president of an idea that I had to be able to save the eastern coal fields, to put thousands and thousands of people of our, of our people back to work. And, and, and as Donald, and I call him Donald a lot because he's a friend. He's been a friend forever, and his family the same. But nevertheless, as he's bouncing off the wall like he does, he's a super smart guy, and he's difficult at times to focus, you know, to say the very least. <laughs> and so he's bouncing off the wall. Finally, he won't listen to me, and I know he's concentrating on all kinds of other things, so I just stand up and reach across the desk and grab the President of the United States by his shoulders and said, Donald, you have got to listen to me. And, and then I'm thinking, you're little Jimmy Justice. What are you doing? And everything. But then, lo and behold, again, an idea from the most unlikely little Jimmy Justice is an idea that may very well some way come into being that could have never come from me. It could have never come from me. The idea of how do you create instant jobs in a state that's bankrupt beyond belief with the roads thing that nobody ever thought could happen, it couldn't have come from me. There's no way. I was in the shower one day, and this is true as true can be. I thought, how much money would it cost to let every road job tomorrow in the state of West Virginia that we had on the books? How much would it cost to do that? And I thought, well, every road job that we're going to do over the next 30 years that's already engineered, how much would it cost to do them all tomorrow? Because that would be the ticket to instant jobs, you know? Well, I get it up, it came up to $125 a living, breathing human in West Virginia. $125 times 1.8 billion million people. And if you could spread that out over 20 years, and then you, now you're in my arena, and I could take it at present value those dollars and take it to Wall Street and sell them on it, maybe they would write me a check back 
and I could turn and have the to check to the highway department and say, do every job tomorrow. And it would start us on our way. Now, we didn't do $125 from every living person because we couldn't do that, but we took a little bit, a little bit in this bucket, a little bit in this bucket, and we pulled it off. Again, I mean this, and I don't mean this to flatter me in any way. I'm not smart enough to have come up with that idea. There's no way. So you see, at the end of the day, I know he, I'm just, I'm just the instrument, and he's moving me around everywhere I go all the time. And all I am doing is just trying to stay out of his way and not mess it up, you know. But, but anyway, I. I'm going to quit talking, but I want you to ask me. I want you to ask me anything that's on your mind. And you can't hurt my feelings. Yeah, you can. <laughs> but when you do, I'll think about Sean O'Brien. Mm -hmm. Yes. I really will. And I'll know how incredibly blessed I am in every way. So please, ask me something. And just talk to me like I'm Jim, and you're whomever you are. Dan talks to me. Yes, sir. Jim, uh, I'm Ted Morrill from Ruby 94.1. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, if, and I've asked some of the ministers here today the same question. If you could pray for anything right now, what would it be? Well, the question was, if I could pray for anything right now, what would it be? It wouldn't be, it would surprise you, it wouldn't be for riches and, and greatness all over. It surely wouldn't be for riches or greatness with me. It, it, may, it may go back to a lot about wisdom and direction because in so many ways, we have lost our way. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. You know, we have lost our way in so many different areas. And as we continue forward, I mean, just think about this, and this is what I would, how I would think. You know, when I grew up, Oceana, West Virginia was Mayberry. You know, and and you know, I rode my bike to school every day and I had school clothes and play clothes and and look look what's happened to us in fifty years plus, sixty years now. You know, look how we have regressed in every way from from whether it be abortion to pornography to, to just to safety to to outrageous living for just the next sound by or whatever it may be, how we've had an assault on the church, and just on and on and on. Look what's happened in 60 years. Now, what if, what if in the next 60 years, we regressed as much from the moral fiber of who we really are as we have in the last 60? <coughs> Where are we going to be? Where are we going to be? There's not enough riches and fame and everything to even halfway overcome that. So if I were to have the opportunity to pray for one thing, I would probably pray that some, day, some way, somehow, we would have the wisdom to readjust our moral compass in life that we would do the right thing. It used to be, you know, we knew the difference between right and wrong, and we did what we thought was right. And today, right and wrong doesn't matter in a lot of ways. All that matters is what you can get by with. Well, so that's what I would pray. Thank you. Thank you very much. Somebody else asked something. Come on now, don't be shy and everything. You've got me here. Beat on me while I'm here. <laughs> I have a question. 
Okay, sir. <coughs> Lynn Halstead, one of our area managers. Would you support the uh, Art 5 Convention for the States? Are you a supporter of that? Now, to help me, I help me. Well, that's where the states, uh, they take so many states in order to have a convention to bring their proposal before the federal government that could be an amendment to the Constitution. Would you support that? Don't mean to throw anything at you. No, I mean, no, I'm, I'm and, and I, I always try to answer without, you know, giving you some dance through the raindrops and everything. But uh, in this, I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to dance a little bit here, not because I want to, but because I just don't have the knowledge. I don't, I don't know, you know, it, uh, it's why, it's why the states... Oh, I, I understand. I understand that and everything. But it just... What I'm saying is there's there's multitudes of pros and cons. There's multitudes of that and everything. And I don't know all the multitudes. And so it's very tough to give you a good answer. Could you address the opioid crisis as it particularly relates to the faith community in West Virginia? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me tell you this, the, uh, the drug and or opioid crisis in West Virginia especially, you know, is, again, is driven by, in my opinion, first is we've lost hope. I mean, and we've got to have hope back. And we're, and, and, and in all honesty, having the ability to have a job brings back a whole lot of hope. Now. We can make one or two decisions. I mean, you know, we can decide tomorrow, you know, that we're just going to incarcerate everybody and then just let them rot and die and let them, and let them go away, you know. Or we can decide that what we should do as good human beings is to try to find solutions and answers and help. And so, so I really believe with all in me we need stricter laws and we need to some way be as punitive as we can possibly be to, to those if, if they be doctors that are prescribing things that they shouldn't be prescribing you know, beyond belief or they be drug pushers that are coming in from Detroit and everything. We need, we need very, very, very stricter laws. But then in order, if you want an answer to what we're going to have to do to fix this, Here's the problem with not, with, with not being able to fix it. You had a runaway demand for those drugs because of hopelessness. A runaway demand. And you had a lot, a lot, a lot of people, whether they say whether they were in drug companies or doctors or whatever, drug pushers or whatever, that were taking, taking advantage of yes. because they wanted the money, you know, now. <clears throat> so, here's the thing, how do you fix it? Well, West Virginia has been so impoverished that we, we just, all we could throw at it was a band-aid and an aspirin. And you're never going to fix it like that. You're never ever going to fix it like that. We need social workers, we need treatment facilities, we need to some way, because drugs are, the opioid crisis, Drugs in general are touching us all. They're touching, it doesn't matter, black, white, rich, poor, union, non-union, it doesn't matter. They touch all of us. And so to fix it, in all honesty, you're going to have to have a major, major pot of money or it will teetotally, in the end, cannibalize us. You know, now, we are trying every way that I know we can try from our standpoint. You know, here's, here's another example of what I'm saying. If you've only, if, if, if this is going to take, and it will, it will take hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. It will take legislation. It will take a commitment from all of us. If we're truly going to try to bring our people back, you know, and save our people and do what we should be doing in my book, it's going to take a real life, big time commitment. Today, West Virginia is trying to crawl out of the ditch, and we're out of the ditch and everything, but we're just barely out of the ditch, and we've got a lot of mud on us, and we're moving, 
We're moving. And we can dedicate more and we can do more. I just came up with an idea. I just said this. And, and again, I give all the credit for the good ideas to the good Lord. And I probably will take the credit for the bad ones. But, but nevertheless, I thought, what, what about just this? What about if we would still continue to try to take care of every aspect of the state, you know, from everything to the drug companies to the doctors to the pushers to everything, and then we would establish a pilot program, maybe one in the north and one in the south, and we would try to perfect, perfect that county in the south and in the north. And if we could perfect it, basically, then we could franchise it. And we could take our perfection and our knowledge everywhere. You see, it's, just to tell it like it is, it's too big a problem, in my opinion. Now, you can help and continue to help everywhere. But it is so big that you can't fight on every front all the time. You just can't. There's not enough people, there's not enough money to win the battle fighting everywhere all at the same time. You can maintain what we're already doing and try to make improvement everywhere like we're already doing, but we've got to find the key to Emerald City here. And nobody's got it yet. Nobody's got it. You know, there's a tax from the faith-based communities, there's a tax there's a tax on us. There's a tax from everywhere. And so, the long and the short of it is, I, I, I hope that answered your question, I, you know, uh, as to what we're trying to do. You were going to ask something, sir. Yes, sir. I'm Pastor Danny Williams. Uh, I have a small church, and we have problems with the utility companies, Appalachian Power and Mountaineer Gas and some of the other ones. All the small churches, we run off of a budget, but they will not give us a budget because they consider us a business. And the little churches are struggling, and we need we need somebody to speak up for us, and see if somebody can do something about that. Because without our churches, we lose our community. Right. I have a question. Um, well, and you know the rates have went up for everybody, home, business, everything. Yeah, and, and, and let me, the only reason I pause is just, is just to tell you what I'm trying to do, you know. Our electricity rates in this state have gone up and up and up and up. And, and state, a state that is so rich beyond belief with natural resources, yes. Why in the world is that happening? Yes. You know, and so there's there's many things that are going on, and it would take forever for me to get through it. But there's many things going on that is a real. I mean, let let me make it. Let me give you an analogy. If you grow corn in West Virginia and you go to sell the corn in West Virginia today. You would probably, if the market, if the board of exchange is, is, I don't know, four dollars and twenty-five cents, and the you would get what's called a basis over that because there isn't any corn in West Virginia, you know, and if you would get a basis over that of a dollar over that, and so you would get for your corn today if you sold it to the feed store or something in West Virginia, five dollars and twenty-five cents. Because there is no corn to amount to anything in West Virginia. Five dollars and twenty-five cents, a dollar over the board. What would you get corn? What would you sell corn for in Iowa City, Iowa? You know, or Decatur, Illinois. What would you sell it for? You know, here's what you'd sell it for. You'd sell it for seventy cents under the board. Because there's corn for as far as you can see. So in other words, if you're the feed store and you're in Iowa City, Iowa, you're buying corn there for $3.50, and in West Virginia, you're buying corn for 5 dollars 
why in the world, if we're an energy state, shouldn't we be buying the corn for $350 yes. instead of $525? We act like, as a state, we abound in natural gas and we abound in coal like crazy, and yet we pay way too high. Way, way, way too high. But we're working at it. We're really working at it. Thank you. Good answer. Yes, sir. Just recently, just a few days ago, there was an article in the paper that West Virginia is 50th on people who are looking for jobs. And a large part of that problem is the welfare system. Uh, they, they, people get, uh, you get a young woman that's having some babies. She moves in one of these low-income places. Her live-in or boyfriend uh, goes down the street, sells drugs, and then when it comes time for the uh, welfare people to check them out, she runs him out of the house, and 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 they get all these kind of subsidies that I feel like we're contributing to the problem. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not. I don't, I don't mean to sound. Uh, I'm concerned about people I am. And I grew up in pretty much in poverty myself. But uh, I think I think our state and nation is contributing to what's going on. Well, I can't disagree with you. You know, I mean, logic tells us that you know that we we impoverish a lot of people because of things that we just, we pass and we do, you know, as from a legislative standpoint. I would tell you this, in West Virginia this past year, and I probably, this was a tough decision, but you know, I basically, we just basically passed legislation that if you're a, an able body and you don't have dependents and whatever like that, then you got to go to work to basically receive benefits, or at least you've got to try to go to work. Now, it was the first step, you know, and we've probably got more to do, but <clears throat> I was thinking about what you were saying and I lost my thought, you know, because, I, oh, I know what it was now. Think about this just a, a second, because this will be the most profound thing that I say today, because, you know, for those of you that know me, you know, you would know there's not going to be a whole lot of profoundness come from me. <laughs> but think about just this for a second. Have we, as politicians or as media, have we through the years basically, have we perpetuated us to be slaves to poverty? <clears throat> Have we perpetuated us to be slaves to being 50th? Have we done that? Because what I am saying to you is just this, going back to Moses and all the Israelites being slaves, you know, when they left, basically somebody has got to stand up and say, we don't need to keep beating us down to being 50th, is what I'm saying. We have been conditioned as West Virginians to, to feel like you should know your place. And your place is just hopefully one notch better than Mississippi, if Mississippi edges us out. You know, but nevertheless, through all that, as we try to climb out, whether it be truly politicians that want to prey on the weak and keep you down here to where they can basically stay in office because you're down here, or the media that wants to keep you suppressed because that's how they promote themselves. 
You see, that's what we've done. And that may be ridiculously profound or, or not profound, but to me, we're so much better than 50th, and we're so good in so many ways, and we need to be winning and thriving and going to the forefront in every way. We don't need to be held back. We don't need to be held back. What you're talking about in a lot of ways is a family that, you know, a lot of times is, is because of the rewards that we give, we push that family down. Well, we've done it and done it and done it. And, I say, and, I, and people get really mad at me for saying this because I'll look at politicians or former governors and I'll say, you know, we've proven how to be dead last. Yes. You know, you got that down pat. I don't want any part of that. And they look, they're mad at me, you know. But it's a fact. It's a fact. I mean, when my grandfather was a little boy, we were dead last. And we are stuck, don't get me wrong, we all know in here it's the greatest state in the world, on the, in, in the nation, the world, everything to live. The people are the best. There couldn't be any better. There's no way it could possibly be any better. But only we seem to know that. The people on the outside don't know that. And a lot, a lot, a lot of things that we really need for successes and wins, we don't have here. We have a high electric bill. We have situations where the education process is not good. We, in my opinion, were underpaying our teachers and still are probably underpaying our teachers. There's so many things that we ought to be, that we ought to have. You ought to be able to go to the convenience store without tearing your car all to pieces because the road is so bad. You know, there is so many things that we probably should have, but yet if we keep pushing ourselves down, we keep running the same play, that's what we're going to get. Now, those politicians don't like me in a lot of ways, but that's okay with me because there's not one threat of me, and I'll end by saying this because I'm taking up too much of your time. I'll end by just telling you just this. There's not a single thing that anyone has in government in any way that I want. Nothing. Nothing. That is exactly where I have stood from day one. They can't do anything for me. What I want is for you and our people. That's what I want. I want goodness for you. There's no way they can give me enough money or prestige or status or ego or the next hot tip, there's nothing they can give me. Nothing. They can't give me the next highest elected office or they can't give me the next election. Or There's nothing that they can give me that I want for me. I want just one thing. I want goodness for you. And you can believe it or not believe it and I don't really care because I know it. My dad used to give almost every gift that he gave, and he would give it anonymously. And he drove us crazy with it. He drove us crazy with this because he would, he would go to the extreme, extreme, extreme to try to make it secret what he was doing. And I'd say, Dad, what are we doing? I mean, for crying out loud, Dad, you're driving us crazy with this. Will you please quit this? I said, why are we doing this? And I can tell you over and over and over, my dad said, Jimmy, all that has to know is I know 
and the good Lord knows. Amen. And that is all that needs to know. You know, and so, so really and truly, at the end of the day, I had probably some really good teaching. You know, my dad was tough. And my mom beat me with a switch every day. <laughs> I'm just teasing. She did leave me alone. <laughs> but I deserved every bit of it, too. But uh, unless, I mean, I'm yours, but if, if, if you don't really have anything else, I've held you up long enough, and I can never thank you enough for having me. Yes, sir. Two or three influences in your life outside of your family, whether a school teacher, a pastor, or a coach in a school teacher? Well, from a teacher standpoint, Dr. Robert Alexander, you know, was the dean of the business school at Marshall University. And I transferred there from the University of Tennessee, and I went in to take a freshman principles of management class from him. He looked like Dr. Bombay. He's 87 or 8 years old now, and he's still living and everything. He had this mustache and everything. He looked like Dr. Bombay on Bewitched. <laughs> and just a wonderful man. He walked in, and I'll never forget the first day. Y'all going to have to forgive me then for, for saying this, because I'm, I'm going to say a little bit of a word. It's a little off color, is what he said. So please forgive me going in. But anyway... He said, he said, well, let's see how we did the last semester in this class. He said, he opened his great book up and flipped it open, and he said, well, let's see. In this class, we had 19 A's, 22 B's, and 2 C's. He said, well, what about this other class? He flipped it open, and he said, oh, this class, we did better. 26 A's, 19 B's, and no C's. And I said to myself, this is the class I want to be in. Absolutely, this is going to be a cakewalk. And then, and again, forgive me for this, then he peered out from over the, uh, you know, over top of his little wire rim glasses, and he said, you see, in my class, if you don't make an A or a B, then I feel like I'm not doing my job. But you can buckle up, because I'm getting ready to work your ass off. <laughs> and that's exactly what he said. Best teacher I ever had. You know, uh, along the way, there was a lot of great coaches. And along the way, you know, there was a lot of great ministers. You know, I could go through lots and lots and lots of uh, discussion. One of the great ministers that I'm able to be with very, very often is this man sitting right here, Dan Anderson. But there's been, but I take a tremendous amount of influence in my life from my family and uh, I miss my dad I miss my mom every day you know but uh, but I have a wonderful little grandson now and two wonderful children and I'm gonna have to put Kathy to sleep uh, I'm just teasing now y'all laugh <laughs> No, you know, no, Kathy has been my dear wife for 450 years now, and, and, and Kathy and I tease one another all the time, and lots of you know Kathy, she's a really great, great person. But anyway, that's it for me. Again, I thank you, and, and may God in every way, May our dear Lord in every way bless you because you are our fabric. You are our last hope. You really are. As this world continues to spiral, whether you like it or not, as we used to play tag, you're it. So be it and keep doing the great work you do. I could never thank you enough. So... God bless you. Thank you.